Hey guys, my name's Joe, also known as Joey, sometimes known as Dream Drop Boyfriend 07. Have you been enjoying Kingdom Hearts? Too bad, now you get to watch another one of my stupid videos, except this one's even longer. Today we're going to be covering a lot more than we did the last time, because I'm a glutton for punishment. Let's do a little recap first. First things first, Kingdom Hearts 2 is one of my favorite games, because I really enjoy the gameplay. It's kind of like Devil May Cry if Devil May Cry sucked. I hope Josh liked it. If not, then he could keep it to his fucking self. How about that Xemnas guy, huh? What a character. By the way, if you haven't figured it out by this point, Xemnas was the secret boss from the first game. Speaking of secrets, when it comes to post-game content, Kingdom Hearts 2 has more going on than one. Again, I wrote this script before they got up to Kingdom Hearts 2. In fact, they're about to start their third attempt of Infinite Fusion, so let's go off the assumption that they decided challenge is too challenging. So, where to begin? Maybe the Paradox Cups. At some point in the game, you could go talk to Hades and have a new set of cups to go after. They're tough, or at least the last one is, because there are a hundred matches in that one. A lot of bosses in there, too. Then there's the old standby, Sephiroth. This time, they decided to move on from boy band idols to actual voice actors. Well, that's an interesting sword you're carrying. It's the Deep Blade! I see. So that's a Keyblade. I mean, it's not great, but it's definitely not. Come, power! I have to assume you guys did the portal organization fight thingies. Or at least a few of them. They're hard to miss. But what I'm not sure you guys did is the Cavern of Remembrance. It can't be beaten until you fully leveled up your drive forms, which can be a real pain in the ass. But by the end of it, you're given a pretty difficult barrage of nobodies. If you make it past that, you then have the ability to fight all 13 members of the Data Organization. They are supercharged versions of all the organization fights before. If you guys did make it that far, I can't blame you for not beating them all. Time is of the essence after all. If you beat them all, you're given a crown. That's it, really. Now for the plot-relevant secret boss, the equivalent to Xemnas in Kingdom Hearts 1. The Lingering Will. If you go back to Disneyland after beating the game, Chip and Dale tell you that a fucking black hole emerged in the throne room. If you go into it, you're transported into a desert area, where there only sits a set of armor holding a keyblade. It thinks you're Xehanort, the last thing anyone wants to be thought of, so he starts attacking. This fight was considered to be the most difficult in the series, up until Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind, but maybe you'll see that one for yourself. For good reason, too, it's hard as shit. I've never beaten it, never even got close. But there's one thing that helps people come back to super difficult boss fights. Good music. And this one's got just that. Rage Awakened is my and many others' favorite song in the series. Did you know? The composer for the series, Yoko Shimomura, also composed music for the Mario and Luigi games. If you beat it, it just goes back to bed. Turns out it's very cranky at this time of day. And after that, that's all there is to talk about. So now we have to go back to the infilling. It's one I'm best at. But I need to give you a fair warning. You won't be making it out of this one the person you were before. This will be the order of which I'll be tackling the games. I know it's a bit unorthodox. If you got a problem with it, here's my phone number. We could talk it out like adults. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep was a game released on the PSP in 2010. But real fans know that it was actually released in the human subconscious around the dawn of time. This game is the most important one in the series. Without Birth by Sleep, there is no Kingdom Hearts. It's the glue that holds the series together. It's a shame that it's expired Elmer's glue. The game received very positive reviews on release, and I used to think it was one of my favorites. But then I played two again after a while and opinions changed. The big gimmick of this one is that there are three story modes, and I wish I could say that they're short but the total cutscene time and chain of memories with both story modes was three hours. This game has six hours. <sighs> Here it goes. It takes place ten years before Kingdom Hearts 1. These three idiots are talking about friendship and perhaps sea salt ice cream. These three idiots meaning Terra, a potential candidate for the world's smallest brain. You'll see why later. Aqua, the one with very little personality outside of being the mother figure of the group. And Ventus. I can explain. Later, Ventus is voiced by Jesse McCartney, like with Roxas, and the voice actors for Terra and Aqua got better in Kingdom Hearts 3. Did you know? In the 2.5 re-release of Kingdom Hearts 2, Roxas' voice clips in battle are changed from the original. 
I suppose they figured the new ones were more fitting. Maybe it's nostalgia, but I kind of like the old ones. Not enough to care, though. Hey, what are you laughing at? I can't help it. You two would make the weirdest brothers. <laughs> what does that even mean? Anyway, tomorrow, Tara and Aqua are going to have their Keyblade Mark of Mastery exam. So they practice a little bit. It's a tutorial. It's here that we see some of the main differences in the combat system from previous games. The command menu is a thing of the past. Now we have the command deck. Basically, from the pause menu, you could add moves, spells, and items to a queue of sorts. If you use a move or a spell, there's a bit of cooldown time before you could use it again. There's no MP or anything. On top of that, there's also now this epic thing called Shot Lock. You press the shoulder buttons to go into this targeting mode, and if you target stuff good, you hit good. You can have certain different Shot Lock moves equipped throughout the game, so look out for those. Shot Locking comes back in Kingdom Hearts 3, so be ready for that. The following day, the Mark of Mastery has come, and Terra and Aqua seem to be ready. The test is given out by Master Ericus, who's voiced by Mark Hamill. He's a father figure towards the three of them. Sitting in on the test is... Wait a minute. Could it be? Has the time come? Ladies and gentlemen, hailing from Scala Ad Kylie, weighing in at 136 pounds, he wears the void like he wears that jacket. Give it up for the hunchback, fresh prince of darkness, Master Xehanort! But no one knows he's evil just yet. Everyone thinks he's just a wise old sage passing down his wisdom. He's voiced by Christopher Lloyd, I, I mean Rutger How, I, I mean Leonard Nimoy. Jeez, he's cursed. Anyway, we get right to the action and the exam begins. The test consists of... smacking some balls around. Is that all it takes? Think I could be a Keyblade Master? Xehanort decides he doesn't like this shit either and turns them into dark balls. Ericus is pretty incompetent as a teacher because Ventus just jumps in and helps them, even though he's not taking the test. They get through that hardship, and they move on to the next and final trial. They must fight to the death. The last one standing is labeled, a Keyblade Master. It reminds me of Ericus' exam when he was becoming a Keyblade Master. Nah, I'm just pranking you. No one dies in Kingdom Hearts. They have a friendly little no-consequence baby match. But Terra starts losing and activates ultimate Goo Goo Gaga mode. That gets him disqualified and Aqua gains the mark. Terra goes to sulk about how darkness is bad and so is he, and Xehanort comes out to say that Ericus is a doo-doo head, and that he sees Terra as the true master because the darkness is nothing to fear. He tells him that darkness shouldn't be dismissed, but rather utilized to his advantage. Ventus is hanging out in his room, swinging a fake keyblade even though he has a perfectly good real one, when this weird weirdo appears to taunt him. Ventus asks who he is, and he replies, I'm you, but Sora. What? And then he teleports away. Ericus gives Terra and Aqua a mission after getting off a steamy phone call with Yen Sid. Apparently this new threat called The Unversed is threatening the Princess of Hearts in their homeworlds. They feed off negativity, so that's how you know they're some messed up guys. He sends them on their way, but also pulls Aqua aside for a second to ask her to make sure that Terra doesn't get too dark, you feel me? That second he had her pulled to the side was just enough time for everything to go wrong. Ventus catches a whiff of Terra leaving and gives chase. After catching up with him, Terra's like, yeah, yeah, sh sh shut up a second. Watch this shit. And he touches his armor and turns on super mode, and then he opens a portal to Sleeping Beauty and drives right into it. And then he turns into a dinosaur. Ventus realizes that he also has a piece of armor and touches it. And then he turns into a dragon. What if you rolled onto it in your sleep? He went into a portal, but it took him to Snow White instead. Ericus gets panicked from this and tells Aqua to get Ventus home safe, so now it's Aqua's turn to be epic. Time to dick around in Disney Worlds for 12 years? Unfortunately, this time a lot of them tie into the main story, so I have to talk about them in a bit more detail. Not too much, though. Let's start with Terra in Sleeping Beauty. He meets up with Maleficent, who very easily tricks him into doing her bidding. In your heart, there is darkness just waiting to be awakened. I don't know what you're talking about. He extracts Aurora's heart. How could I do this? Vin! Ventus eventually gets to Cinderella. Oh! How interesting. I've never seen a mouse like you before. It's called a twink, ma'am. Okay, so if I clip the funny moments like I did with the last two games, we'd be here for an eternity. So I gotta pick and choose. Starting with these. Lady Tremaine. 
I'd better pay her a visit. <laughs> this is what happens when you go against my wishes. <laughs> the darkness in their hearts overtook them. Stop lying! See for yourself all the powers of hell! Okay, so after a while, Terra's cruising around space looking for some alien babes, when he's telepathically told by Xehanort to meet at the desert world that is from a Disney movie. They meet, and Xehanort tells Terra to be wary of a boy in a mask named Vanitas, as he is the one who controls the Unversed. As it turns out, Xehanort initially trained Ventus, but the darkness in the lad's heart was getting to be too much, so he extracted it, thus creating Vanitas. Xehanort instructs him to go to Radiant Garden, as that's where he predicts Vanitas will strike next. Meanwhile, Vanitas flies in front of Ventus and lures him to the Desert World from Desert World 2, a Disney movie. There they do battle, after Vanitas taunts Ventus about Terra being a different person once this whole ordeal is over. Vanitas is wiping the floor with Ventus and is about to kill him, but everyone's favorite mouse in training appears to save the day, and then they beat him up and he retreats. The two have a little chat, and Mickey shows that he's been getting around with this star shard, but it doesn't really work great. It just kicks in whenever it feels like it. Speaking of which, it kicks in, teleporting Ventus to Radiant Garden. He explores around before running into two guards, Alias and Dylan. Look familiar? A big ol' unverse shows up, and Ventus gives chase. The other two do as well before being stopped by Evan, who has a real shit-eating grin in this game. Aqua sees Terra on his way to Radiant Garden and follows him because they all need to be at Radiant Garden, okay? After Terra lets Merlin borrow his Winnie the Pooh book in exchange for a kiss, he sees another big ol' unverse. Ventus is chasing after his own big boy and saves Scrooge from it. In exchange, Scrooge gives Ventus three lifetime passes to Disney Town, okay? After making a detour and reading Merlin's copy of Winnie the Pooh in exchange for a kiss, he continues to chase the big fella. Aqua makes it to the big city and goes towards the castle in search of Terra. There, she sees a young girl being chased by an unversed. Mickey also caught this and is on the job with Aqua. After beating them, Aqua comments on how she could feel immense light emanating from this little girl. I'm sure you could tell, but that's Kyrie. Before you know it, Mickey's star shard kicks in and he's gone. Aqua casts a spell on Kyrie so that she'll always remember the debt she owes to Aqua for saving her. Then she's distracted by a third big boy and gives chase. All their chases lead to the same place. It's looking to be a 3v3. They finish the last piece off in style, and then they talk about how cool they are together and how awesome friendship is. Ventus gives Terra and Aqua the other two passes to Disney Town. He said to take two grown-ups. You mean us? <laughs> oh, Ven. <laughs> you know that we're both 13 years old. Then they get into a fight about who's gonna go first. Terra demands he goes first. Terra! Just stay put! He's taking the shortcut while monologuing about how Xehanort is the only person he could trust, when suddenly he's stopped by pre-nobody Zigbar, aka Brag. He has Xehanort captive, uh-oh. He's holding him ransom for a Keyblade because he really wants one, apparently. Terra's having a hard time holding back his inner demons against Brag because he's in love with Xehanort. He shoots a ball of darkness at him and gives him a scar and also has the weird side effect of explaining why he has an eye patch later on. Anakin is ashamed of himself at first, but Palpatine reassures him that using the dark can get him laid, telling him that he truly is the one that should have been named Jedi Master and not Aqua. He sends him off, calling him Master Terra, before shining the evilest evil smile you've ever seen in your life, and Terra's loving it. Ventus is going after Terra, but first helps out our next piece of lore, Ienzo. Zexion is a little boy doesn't smell quite as bad yet. Evan comes to take him back to the castle and instructs Ventus on where to find Terra. He catches up with him, tries to get him to let him tag along. He says no and leaves. Why did I put this in the script? Aqua runs into Vanitas and they duke it out. She beats him and tries to unmask him, but she's thrown off by the best evil laugh Hala Jolasma could make. <laughs> and then he leaves. Then Ventus catches up with her and tries to get her to let him tag along. She says no one leaves. Why did I put this in the script? Ventus starts crying about having shitty friends they don't want him to get hurt, when he's distracted by even more lore, Isa and Lee. Lee immediately challenges Ventus to a friendly fight for no reason. Lee loses and Isa pokes fun at him. Do I have Stockholm Syndrome or is this kind of a cute moment? They leave and Lee now has two friends that look identical. Briggs a bit upset that he lost an eye during the fight, so he's getting revenge as you can see. Xehanort puts a keyblade at his throat, so that's the end of that conflict. Xehanort says if they get through this, he'll give Brig his keyblade. That's... generous. 
Tara finally makes it to Disney Town and walks in the middle of the road because he wanted to pull some insurance fraud. It wasn't cheap getting here, you know. He almost gets run over by Pete, but didn't get hit. In retaliation, he destroys Pete's car and then he just leaves. The law at Disney Town is quite incompetent, so they throw Pete in jail for this. And by jail, I mean the Realm of Darkness. Don't worry, though. Maleficent bails him out on the condition that he joins her in her conquest to be supreme ruler of the Omniverse. Ventus gets to Olympus and sees Skinny Hercules as well as Zack from Final Fantasy VII. Neato. Fast forward to Terra being there and Hades turned him into Dark Man. But it's okay, Terra beat the shit out of him. Fast forward again to Aqua being there and she fights Hades. And by that I mean the Ice Giant. Then Zack asks her out on a date and she doesn't know how to respond because she's a character from Kingdom Hearts. Now we're in Neverland, yippee! Guess when I sat down to rest, I must have fallen asleep. But where'd you come from? Well, you see... You ever heard of Union Cross? Captain Hook tricks Terra into guarding me treasure by saying there's light in the box and Peter Pan is dark and wants the light box. It works beautifully because Terra's dumb as a stump. Are you Peter Pan? And me! The light is not yours to take. Now what is this? Pirate treasure, of course. Jewels, doubloons, you know, the usual stuff. I've been guarding a pile of loot? Boy, you sure cut that monster down to size. <laughs> this game is too much. Cannon fire? Where's it coming from? A cannon? Anyway, Captain Hook dies and the Lost Boys get a chest to put all the things they treasure most in. Ventus puts in his toy sword cause he don't need that no more. But then Vanitas snaps it in half and Aqua didn't like that one bit and kills him. But not really though. Ventus gets to Yen Sid Tower by accident. It meets everyone's favorite two half pints. It's there that they figure out that the rat's in danger. Meanwhile, Terra gets to Destiny Islands by accident. There he sees baby Sora and Riku, and he bequeaths the Keyblade to Riku for no reason at all. Meanwhile, I got sucked into writing this shitty script by accident. Ventus finds Mickey unconscious on the floor, but waiting for him there is Xehanort. I guess he beat up the mouse. They lock eyes for a second, but then Ventus gets a headache and he starts to remember stuff. You see, Xehanort didn't train Ventus just for the sake of making him stronger. Ventus used to have a lot of darkness in him, we've gone over this. It was extracted, creating Vanitas. But this wasn't something that was done because he had to. Xehanort's main goal is to unlock Kingdom Hearts. How do you do that? You need the ultimate Keyblade. Or at least, it's one of the most important ingredients. The others will show themselves soon. How do you make such a key? A union between a heart of pure light and a heart of pure darkness. Xehanort trained Ventus, because if he managed to tap into his powers of darkness, this key would be forged. But Ventus couldn't utilize the darkness in his heart, and so Xehanort resorted to creating Vanitas and waiting for Ventus to grow stronger so they could reunite and create the all-powerful Keyblade. No, not the Keyblade, dumbass. The Keyblade. The Greek letter for Chi or Kai. But we're not gonna pronounce it that way, are we clear? You think these writers don't know what they're doing? Xehanort says flat out that it could be pronounced differently. Ki, the most ancient some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. But we're gonna pronounce it Key. And if you're wondering why, well the answer is simple. You see, Death Stranding is a game by Kojima Productions released in 2019. It received very mixed reception upon release due to its unique gameplay style. It is a racing game. Anyway, Xehanort sends Ventus off to see Ericus before calling his side hoe, Terra. He tells him that Ventus is gonna try to fight Ericus to learn the truth about his origins. He leaves quickly to catch up. Everything is going extremely according to plan for Xehanort. Ventus goes back home and confronts Ericus on keeping the truth about his origins from him. This triggers a flashback to a conversation between him and Xehanort, where he says he wants the Keyblade Forge to trigger a Keyblade War. There was a war centuries ago, but very little was recorded from it, as not too many people lived to tell the tale. Hence why there are only a handful of people that can use the Keyblade. But one of the few scraps of information was that an all-encompassing light was triggered from it, the likes of which Kingdom Hearts has never seen. This intrigues Xehanort to no end for some reason. He thinks that the ruin that would be caused by another Keyblade War could bring about a wonderful age. A... Keyblade Renaissance, if you will. After all, ruin brings creation, does it not? 
Anyway, back to the present, Ericus says he needs to kill Ventus so that Xehanort cannot have his way. He's about to limit this character design quantity back to one, but Terra comes in at the last second. Ericus says, well, I guess I gotta kill two boys today, and cries about it for a second. But enough of that pussy shit, time to kill someone that I view as my own son. Terra lets loose his inner demons to clash against Ericus' outer demons. He spawns a portal for Ventus to go through, but, but, but wait a minute. Why do they even need the fucking space mobiles if they can teleport? Oh, whatever. Terra beats Ericus and they have a little moment. Ericus says maybe he was wrong, and honestly he was just pissed off today and needed to take it out on someone. But before that can end, he's shot by Xehanort. He basically just mocks Terra for being a dumbass and then destroys the place. Terra says, suck my cock, Xehanort! He says they'll meet at the Keyblade Graveyard, where the original Keyblade War was fought. Ventus is told the same thing by Vanitas at Destiny Island, which is where he is, apparently. Aqua spots Mickey floating around in space and brings him to Yen Sid's. She's given the news about Ericus and told by him to meet the other two at the yard. It's finally time to end this shit. Aqua meets up with Terra to ask him if he killed Ericus. He says, yeah, kinda. I didn't land the killing blow, but I did most of the work. We still cool? But before she could say yes, Ventus appears. He gives them the skinny on how he's a tool to create the Keyblade, and tells them to kill him because he doesn't want to be a Keyblade. Uh-oh, bad boy alert. Here comes Xehanort and Vanitas. He gives an evil speech, and then they enter armor mode. The battle begins. Terra charges, but oh no, Xehanort did whatever the fuck that was. Vanitas starts riding on Keyblades. I mean, what else are you gonna do with those things? It fucks everyone up, and this fight's already not looking too good. Xehanort's got Ventus, and he freezes him. It kind of looks like he's trying to kill Ventus, doesn't doesn't he need him? No matter, Aqua catches him. Clouds clear up, revealing the one and only Kingdom Hearts. Terra gets to the top to face off against the two alone. Meanwhile, Brag comes in to fight Aqua. His eyes a nice shade of Xehanort now. Oh, so this kiddo thinks he's a full-fledged Keyblade wielder. He's got the angry look down. Of all the faces, why do I look at her and see yours? Why is it that you always have to glare at me like that? Shut up! Xehanort sends Vanitas down to kill Aqua and forge the Keyblade. Terra starts letting the darkness take hold and says with gritted teeth, This cock isn't gonna suck itself, Xehanort. <laughs> Brig retreats, because apparently his job was just to buy time. And then Vanitas sticks the fucking landing, knocked her the fuck out. He's gonna finish the job, but the rage in Ventus thawed him. Then he kind of kills him? He says his body is about to perish, so I guess so. He sheds his mask to reveal... You and I will have to join together. Look, uh, look, I can explain. You see, Breath of the Wild is quite possibly one of the most critically acclaimed games ever, but I don't see the hype too much. In this video I say I'll be- He pins Ventus down with Unversed, because remember, he controls them. And then to complete the union, he just- he just enters Ventus. Terra beats up Xehanort, and he collapses on the ground, but looks like it's too late. The Keyblade fire pillar is already happening. Now Xehanort only has one thing left to do. He pierces his heart with his Keyblade, and by that I mean it starts floating around in him. What a budget. His heart is extracted and his motives are all but clear now. He's going to take Terra's body. I swore I would survive, and be there to see what awaited beyond the Keyblade War. And now, it is your darkness that shall be the arc that sustains me! Mickey wakes up Aqua from getting Vanitas. She finds Ventus intact. Looks like everything's gonna be okay. But hold on, what's that giant fucking Keyblade he's holding? Could it be... The Keyblade? It's Vanitas! He's assumed control of Ventus's body and now has the Keyblade. ruh -ro. He's got two voice actors voicing him, Vegito style. Sucks that they're not very good at it. They're going really slow. This Keyblade will open a door. One that leads to all worlds. Then, Keyblade-bearing warriors will flock here from each and every one of them to battle for the light within Kingdom Hearts! And just like the legend says, 
The Keyblade War will begin! Shut up! I'm sick of your nonsense! My thoughts exactly, Aqua. Meanwhile... This heart belongs again to darkness. All worlds begin in darkness, and also end. The heart Who are you talking to? Again, I must bring up the Japanese dub. It's just, it's just better. What can I say? None of the bullshit is in here. Here, here, look. Kokoro Ventus is trapped in his own heart with Venetus. It turns out the Keyblade isn't fully forged yet because Ventus isn't really into it. Ventus decides he'll sacrifice his own heart to destroy both the Keyblade and Venetus. <laughs> it's always about your friends, isn't it? At least I have some. That be true enough. Terranort won't shut the fuck up, saying, "Yield! You have lost. <laughs> enough. <laughs> Yield." Venetus confesses his love for Aqua. Meanwhile, in his heart, he's still in immense pain from getting roasted by Ventus. But finally. you win. Well, kind of. Terra didn't get his body back and Ventus is now in a comatose state due to his little battle. But at the very least, the Keyblade was destroyed, Venetus is dead, and Terranort got his ass beat. The Lingering Will sprouts its cape for winter and goes to bed, ready to take on the next chump who comes by. The infamous Keyblade explosion sends Terranort flying to parts unknown. The clouds cover up Kingdom Hearts once again. His plans have failed. We won. Now before we move on to the epilogue where it is revealed that we did not win, let's talk about some of the post-game content that this game has to offer. Mainly, the Mirage Arena. Okay, that's not really post-game, but there's a lot of bosses in this. A lot are just big unversed, but there are some unique ones here as well. First there's Monstro from Pinocchio. Interesting choice. Then there's Ericus's armor. And finally, No Heart, Xehanort's armor. Did you know? If you remove the X in Xehanort's name, it's actually an anagram for No Heart. It's like he's a nobody, but he's, but he's not. He's not a nobody. That would be Xemnas. Xehanort's nobody is Xemnas. Don't, don't. It's, it's just a coincidence. Then there's the regular super bosses, starting with Venetus Remnant, who only has one health bar. That means he's easy. And finally, the plot relevant one, the Xemnas and lingering will of this game, the mysterious figure. Did you know? This boss fight fucking sucks. It's not fair in the slightest. It's just cheap. There's no fair way to beat it. You just use cheap strats. But I won't harp on it for too long. He doesn't say anything. All you need to know is he's important and will return in about, uh, let's say 20 minutes. Alright, on to the epilogue. Only a little more. Aqua awakens in Yen Sid's tower. Apparently, Mickey found them drifting in space. Mr. Sid informs Aqua that Ventus's heart has left his body to parts unknown. She says, okay, I'll find a way to make this tie into another game. She goes back home, which has been destroyed by Xehanort, that's a real shame. She finds Ericus's Keyblade and is about to put it to good use, you just wait and see. She puts Ventus in the chair and tells him, give me 12 years, I'll be right back. She uses Ericus's divine powers to turn this shit heap into... 
Castle Oblivion? Oh, I get it. It keeps Ventus safe because this place is such a fucking stupid maze, no one will find him. That's not a joke, that's the official reason. She leaves him there before getting a psychic message from Terra, telling her to kill him because he doesn't want to be a Xehanort. He leads her to Radiant Garden, where Terranort is found dicking around in the town square. She goes to greet him, but his idea of a greeting is choking someone to death. Classic Xehanort. But wait, turns out he has amnesia from getting his shit wrecked by the lingering will. He demands answers on who he is, but the silly man doesn't realize that people can't speak when you're crushing their windpipe. Fight it! Tara, please! Tara, you say? <laughs> Looks like Xehanort's back, and the true final boss can begin. But it's kinda anticlimactic because Terra's fighting back inside and restricting his movements. In response, Xehanort does the heart stab thing he did earlier, in an attempt to expel him from his heart. It didn't really work, all it did was turn Terra into that heartless thing on his back. It took me a while to realize that that was the implication here, but yeah, that thing's Terra. I guess another side effect is that it creates a portal to the Realm of Darkness. You really gotta read the fine print on these heart sacrifice ceremonies. Terra falls in by accident because he tripped on a pebble, but don't worry, Aqua also needs a reason to not be present for the events of the games that take place after, so she jumps in after him. She catches him in her space mobile, but the portal will close before they can make it, so she makes the rational decision and launches Terranort back into the mortal world. And then she falls into the abyss. Baby Sora and Riku are hanging out, when Riku notices that Sora's crying for some reason, but they don't know why. He takes a look deep within his heart and sees Ventus. Turns out, Ventus's heart went inside Sora, and there it resided this entire time. So you see, so you see that's why he and Roxas look identical. Sora's nobody was created in Ventus's likeness. Can you can you please just put the gun down? Handsome the Wise finds Terranort lying unconscious. He asks him his name, and it seems that that's all he remembers. Getting his ass beat twice really fucked with his memory. Handsome decided to take Xehanort under his wing. What could possibly go wrong? Fast forward a little bit, and Xehanort's now a full-time apprentice to Ansem, like we saw in Kingdom Hearts 2. But as we all know, that didn't last. This game takes place after the events of Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm obviously not going to spoil anything about it, but there is one flashback scene I want to talk about. I feel that's fine, considering you guys aren't going to be playing this game anyway. I'll be quick. At some point between Birth by Sleep and Kingdom Hearts 1, Radiant Garden became overrun with Heartless, turning it into Hollow Bastion. During this process, we have a scene of Kairi running away from the Heartless, but it's no use. She's cornered. But hey! Terranort grabs her face! Kairi woke up in, like, a Spartan pod or something. Terranort is conducting a little off-the-books experiment. You see, this is at the point where he's figured out who he really is. He also seems to know that Kairi is a princess of heart, hence why he took her. He's gonna push her out of this world to see if her heart would resonate and attract her to a Keyblade wielder. The reason he gives is that he hopes to return Hollow Bastion back to its... Radiant glory? But remember, this is Xehanort. He's definitely full of shit. He has ulterior motives. What are they? Who's to say? She's launched into the lanes between... Luckily for her, Terranord's hypothesis was correct. Her heart took her to Destiny Islands because of the Keyblade wielder... Riku. Yeah, one little thing I need to explain. Sora wasn't born with the ability to use a Keyblade. Terra bequeathed the Keyblade on Riku, but during the Little Island incident, Riku showed that he wasn't really worthy of using it. So the Keyblade chose a more worthy wielder, Sora. The concept of the Keyblade choosing its owner was completely thrown out the window after the first game, but came back for a second in Birth by Sleep to explain why Sora can use it. But yeah, that's all I had to say there. Everything we've covered so far leads to the prologue to Kingdom Hearts 3, featured on the 2.8 collection. Kingdom Hearts 0.2 Birth by Sleep, A Fragmentary Passage. This game was a glorified tech demo to show that all our years of waiting were worth it. Look how pretty it is! I can't wait to play a full game like this in two more fucking years! But also fuck Xbox players who also eagerly await the game. PS4 exclusive. Sorry, you should have been a PlayStation fan if you wanted the honor to play Kingdom Hearts 0.2 Birth by- I'm calling it Ground Zeroes. Our story begins ten years after Birth by Sleep. 
So, during the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. There's a little pre-rendered intro like usual with Simple and Clean playing for the 3000th time. This time it's a little remix. This is as appropriate a place to bring this up as any, but has anyone caught the lyrics at one point saying, don't get me wrong, I love you, but does that mean I have to meet your father? Aqua's walking along the realm of darkness. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Dark world? She sees Cinderella's world in there. Peculiar. Before she can get there, she's ambushed by Heartless. Here we can have a little taste of what's to come with Kingdom Hearts 3's combat. The command menu makes a return. I think that's for the best. The two games that the command deck is in, it's been very easily exploitable. Other than that, it sure is cool to look at. The movement is natural, the animations are fluid, the effects are pretty. This combat sure... looks good. I'm sure you noticed at this point, but after 10 years, she hasn't aged a day, has she? Especially with the Realm of Darkness likely being pretty stressful. My headcanon is that Keyblade wielders age like Saiyans. Remember when I said the movement was natural? I really only meant that with the combat. It's a bit... floaty out of combat. If you run for a few seconds, you get a boost of speed to help you go around faster. A welcome addition, in my opinion. As it turns out, Cinderella's world is here because it fell to darkness, and Cinderella was subsequently kidnapped along with all the other princesses of heart. She makes her way towards the castle when she sees Terra of all people. What a real thing that's happening. Oh wait, it's the opposite of that. Then she gets to fall in Snow White world. There she sees Comatose Ventus in the Snow White thingy. What a real thing that's happening. Oh wait, it's the opposite of that. She rubs the glass all weird, but then like a genie, if you rub the glass, other glass comes in and you get sacrificed to the glass cult. Now she's in glass world. Seems she wasn't the only person with that exact appearance to be sacrificed. Whew, I think it has a type. She breaks out of there and moves on. She's clearly going insane from being here for 10 years and is chasing after phantoms that she knows are phantoms, going as far as to fight through Darkseid to get to them. Honestly, it would have cracked after three days, so she's doing pretty good. When I said Darkseid, I meant 20 Darksides charging up a spirit bomb. After beating them? She catches up with the phantoms. Weirdly enough though, Terra's speaking to her. It's the real guy, but not physically. His heart has darkness in it, so I guess he can communicate with people in the realm of darkness. Okay... It's in this conversation that it's revealed that Organization 13 wants to explore Castle Oblivion so much so they can find Ventus, and maybe give this whole Keyblade thing another shot. So that's what they meant by finding its secrets. But because this demo could only be so long, Xehanort takes hold once again. He's trying to get Aqua to reveal Ventus' location, but don't worry, Terra's still got enough fight left in him to fight him. Portal Darkseid grabs Aqua, and Xehanort seems to want that even though he needs information from her. Xehanort is fucking stupid. Xehanort grabs Terra's face, he has a habit of doing that, and in retaliation, Terra does the lingering will thingy, but the move is a little too potent and it knocks Aqua out. She awakens to see she's floating in the deep depths of the dark darkness. She's caught and saved by everyone's favorite full-time mouse, except now it seems he has a receding hairline. He didn't come here to save Aqua, however. This was just a big coincidence. Remember, this takes place during Kingdom Hearts 1. He has a mission in this area. He gives her a recap on everything leading up to now in the Realm of Light, and asks her to help him find the key for the door to darkness. They get to Destiny Islands, post Trapped in Darkness. Mickey's thinking maybe the key is in the secret spot. But hold that thought, Demon Tide! Mickey's fucking riding it, and Aqua chains it up. Then they beat its ass for a while until it breaks free. Now it's a demon tornado. You can't toss anything at those two that'll beat them. They get into the secret spot, and what do you know they find it? It's the golden keyblade Mickey has now. Aqua offers to be the one to close the door while Mickey locks it, but Mickey says Riku's already taken the role and he's cooler. They stroll a little longer until they find the door to darkness, aka Baby Kingdom Hearts. Riku also makes it on schedule as well. Looks like they're gonna finish the first game after all. I know Chernobog's hard, but I'm glad you got past it. But more Demon Tide comes in to explain why Aqua wasn't present. It's going for Riku, so Aqua uses lingering will magic to stop it. She's holding it back so the job can be done. Mickey hesitates to leave her behind, so the Demon Tide escapes, and fucks up Mickey so bad that he... he lost his shirt. I appreciate the dedication to being consistent, but I don't think anyone would have been upset if you didn't undress him. Aqua gets swept back outside to Destiny Islands, and that's about it really. Have fun being in there for two more years. Dumbass. Okay, we're gonna jump back into Birth by Sleep. You see, the epilogue was a secret ending that you're only able to get under certain circumstances depending on your difficulty. But there's an even more secret secret ending that's under other criteria depending on your difficulty. This one's just a cutscene and I only care enough to talk about one part of it. It's in the Realm of Darkness, but set after the events of Ground Zeroes, and even after the events of Kingdom Hearts 2. 
Aqua walks up on the shore, where she sees a black coat man. She asks who he is, and he gives a long-winded speech about how he doesn't completely remember everything, but he remembers some things. All I can really notice is that he sounds an awful lot like Ansem the Wise. You wish to return to your own world? Yeah, that's because he's alive. He survived being in the middle of that explosion. It just transported him into the realm of darkness. Remember, no one dies in Kingdom Hearts. They either become a ghost or get amnesia. Just a, just a quick side note, but when I was uh, getting the footage for this cutscene, I couldn't help but notice that specifically just in Kingdom Hearts 2, uh, Xemnas, he, he has like some Xavier inflections. Is this the answer you've been looking for? All that and more. He says that he remembers Sora's name and that he was a pretty cool guy. Apparently his name is so powerful that it travels through time, as we see people who aren't even in existence currently saying it now. Why, his name is so cool, it makes Aqua cry. That's it. I bet you're wondering why I even brought this up. This scene doesn't seem too significant. Well, I don't get paid enough to answer that many questions. That's the end of all Birth by Sleep related content. Now for the others. I'm not gonna lie to you, I was very reluctant to do this one. It's the only part of Kingdom Hearts I haven't even bothered to learn the story for. There's one other canon game I haven't played, but it's completely insignificant aside from one very brief conversation in Kingdom Hearts 3. But I'm not gonna waste 15 plus minutes so you understand that conversation. It's just not worth it. This one, however, is important. Not only to Kingdom Hearts 3, but to Kingdom Hearts 4, whenever that comes out. I never wanted to go over this one because it seems so drastically different in tone, but more importantly, boring. But now I guess I'll be finding out if Kingdom Hearts Union Cross and Kingdom Hearts Cross back cover are any good. Union Cross was a mobile phone game released in 2015. The game's original name was Kingdom Hearts Unchained Cross, and more recently, it was renamed again to Kingdom Hearts Union Cross Dark Road. Honestly, I'm gonna be mainly talking about Back Cover, a movie released on the 2.8 collection, as it explains most of what we need to know. <clears throat> okay, let's go. This one takes place hundreds, if not thousands of years before the events of the main series. At this point in time, the worlds were not worlds, they were all together. This age is known as the Age of Fairy Tales, how long is my shift again? Can someone take over for me, please? The story starts in a place known as Daybreak Town, with the Master of Masters, who I'll just be calling the Master so I could save some breath, Lushu, his apprentice, and his other five apprentices, the Foretellers, Ira, Ava, Envy, Ased, and Gula. I feel like each of the Foretellers names were created for the sole purpose of being confusing to people. Like, think about it, all of these names, but the way that they're spelled, could be pronounced wrong. The Master gives them all a book, it was a book of prophecies, detailing events to come in the future. The final passage reads that a great Keyblade War is incoming, and nothing can be done to stop it. Ira says he wants to try anyway, and the Master says it's useless to try, but go ahead and try anyway. He gives Ira the role of taking his place as the leader. He gives Envy the role of being a supervisor, and making sure nothing goes wrong. Ased was given the role to... support the leader. You're going to be Ira's right-hand man. What? Ava was given the role to be the trainer of Keyblade wielders for when the time came for the war to begin. And Gula was given the role to analyze the Book of Prophecies and make video essays on uncovering its deeper meanings. Gotta say, the Master is definitely a shift in direction for the writing. Well, I might disappear one day. That... Well, I might disappear. Disappear? Why? Where? Speak up sooner if you're listening. It was embarrassing for me. Don't get me wrong, it still isn't good. But I think it's fair to say that it tops most other characters. Take, for instance, Xehanort. He stands around and explains his grand plans directly to you. No subtlety. Unless you want to count tricking the world's dumbest man into being his new vessel as subtle. But with this guy, he keeps his cards close at hand. I can't at all tell what his goals are. Is he a bad guy, a wild card, or something else? I don't know. It's classic Kingdom Hearts to make sure you have more questions than answers by the end of every game. But if the series wasn't oversaturated with that shit, then his secrecy would be fine by me. The Master gives the Foretellers a dumbass cat. It's not a cat, actually. It's called a Chirithi. He says every Keyblade wielder will get one. If said Keyblade wielder succumbs to the darkness, their Chirithi will also become dark and turn into a nightmare. 
It's a clear indication to everyone of who's a bad guy and who isn't, but there's a catch. Apparently, darkness is contagious, so a nightmare can put darkness into the hearts of others around it. So they need to take it out ASAP if they don't want a dark demic on their hands. And then the Master, as well as Lushu, disappear. This is around the point that the events of Union Cross began. Your character is one of the Keyblade wielders that can pick between one of the five Unions, each led by one of the Foretellers. Ava's Union is known as the Dandelions. This one's the only Union I want to talk about because it has a lot of interesting characters in it. We have Skuld, Strelitzia, Ephemer, and Ve... He doesn't belong here, he belongs thousands of years in the future! Unless you want to honestly tell me that he's an ancient being from before the Keyblade War? That's, that's a good one. It was a joke you told me, it was very funny. Okay, okay, let's look at the wiki so I can get the details on this. With this horrifying revelation, he admits to the others about what he did to Strelitzia. Much to his friend's protest, as well as invoking Lorium's anger. But the struggle to remember makes him unable to answer. Feeling something terribly wrong, Ventus goes unconscious, as darkness emerges from him. Four years before Aqua and Terra take their Mark of Mastery exam, Ventus served as an apprentice- Oh, I'm sorry, did I skip 20 pages? Oh no, but they skipped a few thousand years. Okay, maybe the fans can give me the answers I need. So Ventus is a union leader. In all caps. What? That's what I'm saying. Not only did Ventus turn out to have existed thousands of years in the past, but he was also a part of Ava's union and also met with Skald and Ephemer after the war was over as a member of the Dandelions. Okay, and now let's look at the answers. Lol, where have you been? This was covered weeks ago. A week ago where? A week ago where? The Kingdom Hearts fan club? Very sorry, but I couldn't make it that day. Can someone fill me in, please? Think that's it? Get a load of this. Meet Lorium and El Reyna. Look familiar? Yeah, we'll add an X and rearrange and- Wow, what do you know? So both of them were actually Keyblade wielders back in the day. Unlike Ventus, they have some sort of explanation as to what happened in the small window between this and Chain of Memories. And they're both the same, after Kingdom Hearts Union Cross. At some point, Lorium's heart fell to the darkness. Becoming a heartless, Lorium's nobody Marluxia came into being. O okay, so can nobodies live for thousands of years, or... Also, do they remember their past? It seems that Ventus doesn't. Just when I'm starting to think that I might understand, you run even farther away. Let me near you! I'm gonna move on before I'm pushed off the edge. We move on to the next scene after the Master and Lushu have disappeared. It starts really awkwardly. There's a traitor among us. Are you certain? What proof do you have? Ira says he caught a nightmare snooping about the place, and it's gotta be someone's. Everyone calls Ira a dum-dum for jumping to conclusions like that. Then, when he's alone with Envy, he says that nothing in the Book of Prophecies mentions a traitor. So he thinks someone stole a page to cover their tracks. So Ased and Gula are forming a union between their unions to oppose Ira. This was literally two scenes later. The pacing is already a disaster. Envy comes in to disapprove of their actions. The Master forbade unions from coming together. Asad says Envy's the traitor, even though this entire problem started because Ira claimed there was a traitor baselessly. Ava runs off to the local fountain to have an inner monologue about how we're falling apart. And then Ephemer comes in. They have a little chat that whittles down to Ava wanting to deviate from the path that the Master set them on. It seems like they're destined to fall due to this infighting. She tells Ephemer to go to bed, even though it's like 3pm. Sudden cut to a few months later, and it seems Envy convinced Gula to dissolve the Alliance. Ased didn't like this one bit in resorts to physical violence. Then Gula says no backsies and leaves. Ased vows to make Envy pay for ruining his friendship. We then see a flashback of the Master telling him that if he thinks Ira isn't any good as a leader, just replace him, that'd be pretty funny. Ased takes this in the most coolest way and tries to kill Envy, and Ira's next. After a pretty cool fight, Gula and Ava show up. Envy tells them that he's the traitor. They take her word at face value and they draw their Keyblades at him. We don't see this fight, but it cuts to a scene after, and this part of town is all messed up. We then see Gula. He seems to have the hidden page that was mentioned earlier. Apparently, the Master gave him the secret role of finding the traitor, and that page will help. He makes his way to Ased, believing him to actually be the traitor. After telling him what his secret role is, even though the Master told him to not tell anybody, he's gonna finish the job. 
But then I said, gets up, and he's really big, so Gula gets scared. Seems Gula's not very good, because a guy who just got his ass beat beat his ass. Ava comes in and saves him from getting killed. Ased decides he's too tired for this shit and leaves. Ira meets up with Ased because he's limping home and tells him that he forgives him for trying to kill all the others because he thought it would be silly. In exchange for Ira generously being a dumbass, Ased tells him that Gula has the missing page. I suppose for friendship-related reasons, Ava is hiding Gula under a bridge so he doesn't get killed for having that page. Didn't really work out though. Ava's Shirithi tells her that Ira's incoming. He wants to have a little chat with Gula and knows he's hidden somewhere around there. Ava tells him to fuck off, and he does. Huh. After holding hands a bit, Gula tells Ava he's gonna summon Kingdom Hearts, so then the Master will come back. He wants him to come back because he's a funny man. Ava says that that's fucking stupid and against the rules. But that's the point, you see. If they break the rules, the Master will have to come back to reprimand them. Don't know what drew him to that conclusion, but fuck it, I'm down. He begs for Ava's help. She says again that that's fucking stupid, so he leaves to do it himself. In order to summon Kingdom Hearts, he needs Lux, which I believe is just light. And Ira and Ased are doing the same to maintain the balance. Envy says that if people start hoarding light for themselves, it will lead to the Keyblade War beginning. There it's said that one thing in the Book of Prophecies reads that if a Keyblade War were to occur, light will expire and the dark will prevail. Keep that one in your noggin. You might need it later. Suddenly, a flashback to the Master giving Ava her role. He says that the whole light expire dark prevail thing can't be avoided. Nothing can be done to stop it. The Master tells her that she's to train Keyblade wielders so that the light could, maybe, just maybe, barely stick around. Her interpretation of that is to train them to run away into the outside world so that they don't die. That way, the light won't expire. Yet another flashback segment begins. This time with Lushu. Remember him from the beginning? By the way, during this cutscene, very obnoxious piano music is playing. But I haven't done anything yet. Good point. The Master spawns a Keyblade that looks an awful lot like Xehanort's and gives it to him. It has an eye on it if you hadn't noticed. It's called the Gazing Eye. The Master says that that eye is his eye. Ew! Oh, you think that's gross, do ya? N no He gives Lushu the task of passing this Keyblade down to whatever apprentice he may have in the future, and then him to his, and so on because apparently, the way that thing works is that it helps the Master see into the future? The fact that the Book of Prophecies even exists show that Lushu was successful. Until then, Lushu needs to disappear, make himself scarce, him and this box. What's in the box? Good luck answering that one. And with that, the Keyblade War approaches, and the movie ends. It wasn't awful. Shorter than I thought it was gonna be, only around 40 minutes. I was thinking this one was going to be as long as the 358 over 2 movie. I don't have a strong opinion either way. I watched it, it was watched, it existed. It's super important. Alright. Last one. I'm gonna be honest. I'm a bit sad that this is the last one I'll be covering. I haven't had the chance to flex my creative muscles like this before. I'm not sure what was compelling me to write two scripts totaling 75 pages. I've wanted to make some kind of video essay review of Kingdom Hearts 3 since it came out because I feel like I have a lot to say on that. So maybe I'm just testing the waters to see if I can handle it. And after doing all this, I think I can. All right, enough about that. Let's finish this. Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance, originally named 3D Dream Drop Distance, was released in 2012 on the, you guessed it, 3DS. You might be wondering why I'm doing this last, when the last two parts were on stuff from 2017. Well, remember how I said Birth by Sleep was the glue that held the series together? Dream Drop isn't far off. It's the game that ties right into Kingdom Hearts 3. It wasn't released on the 1.5 or 2.5 collection, but rather, you guessed it, the 2.8 collection. Besides 3, I think this is the only game in the series I played at launch. I remember liking it a fair bit, but I haven't touched it since before my opinion had changed on Birth by Sleep, so I fear it might suffer the same fate. The last time I played it was on the 3DS. Unlike Birth by Sleep, Dream Drop had some steep competition on the console it's for. All these games on screen weren't out at the time. Some weren't even announced yet, am I, am I funny yet? But despite that, it got some pretty good reviews. But will the plot hold up to old Dream Drop boyfriend? Come on, you already know the answer to that. The story starts with a flashback. We can assume that this is Terranort's perspective. The machine that he ends up using to turn himself into a Heartless, aka Ansem Seeker of Darkness, seems to have been tested out on some of the lab crew, like Evan and Dienzo, who's still a kid, wow. Briggs a bit confused as to what's going on, 
but Terranort activates Xehanort mode and takes his heart. If you couldn't tell, this is what created Organization 13 at first. He says his name is Ansem, all badass-like. Now back to the present. Remember the message in a bottle that Sora got at the end of 2? Well, it turns out it had two things on it. The first thing was Mickey detailing the events of Coded. I said I wasn't gonna cover it, stop asking. I've been getting non-stop fan mail from my fans asking me to do it, but I won't, I won't do it, okay? Oh, how could I say no to that stupid fucking face? Alright, I'll give you a very brief recap. But not on this video. I put a link in the description to a separate video where I talk about Coded. Or rather, it's DS Remake Recoded. I'll wait for you. You back? Now do you understand why you could never fuck with me? Moving on. The second part of that letter is an invitation. An invitation to their Mark of Mastery exams. Yeah, I, I guess they never took one of those, did they? I suppose they were too busy saving the worlds twice. They make their way over to Yen Sid's. But such great minds are often plagued by a single great question. He gives Sora and Riku the details of what happened in Birth by Sleep, because that game is out in stores today. After catching his breath from that plot synopsis, he says that even though Xehanort, Ansem, and Xemnas are all out of the picture, it's more like the camera didn't get them in the frame. He'll come back one day. In what form? I don't, I don't know, Jenganort? He will very likely have a new plan on forging the Keyblade. You see, by the end of the Keyblade War, the Keyblade was shattered into 20 pieces. 7 pieces of light? and 13 of darkness. So apparently the hard way of forging the thing is a clash between 7 warriors of light and 13 of darkness. They don't have to be pure light and pure darkness, but it would be enough to do the trick. To prepare for that day, we need the biggest, toughest keyblade wielders we can get. So it's time for these two zeros to become heroes. Yen Sid tells them that the way they are now, they ain't shit. Sora justifiably responds, saying, Have you seen the shit we were capable of in Kingdom Hearts 2? What can Keyblade Masters do? Beat up someone with restricted movements and amnesia? Die? Go fuck yourself, we don't need to be masters, right Riku? Actually, I, I forgot everything that happened in Chain of Memories, so I still think I'm grappling with the darkness inside, which is pretty ironic considering you were the one who lost his memories and, and not me. Well, he's not getting the cards this time around, but the command deck comes back, so that's close enough. Sora gives in to something worse than darkness peer pressure, and says he'll take the test too. It's here that we notice that Haley Joel Osment is barely holding on. Then count me in. Put me through the test. Just watch. Me and Riku will pass with flying colors. He gets a better hold of it in Kingdom Hearts 3, but age is definitely affecting his performance. So the test begins, but this time we're not doing that smacking balls pussy shit. Now we're going into the dream realm, where they're to unlock seven sleeping keyholes, and if you die in there, you die in real life. Their dream test begins with them on the raft, that's cute. But then we see the first enemy of the game, Ursula. Bold choice. They butcher her like the rest and fall into the whirlpool. This separates the two. We go to Sora's perspective and see that he landed in Dream Traverse Town, rocking his younger design, as well as a new red outfit. Did you know? Originally, Sora was supposed to be a furry with a chainsaw. You think I'm fucking joking? He starts calling out for Riku to no avail. Well, well, kind of no avail. He attracts the attention of The World Ends With You for Nintendo DS, and more recently, Nintendo Switch. Neku specifically. I have not played that game and know none of the characters, so don't expect me to. He tells Sora to follow him and does some weird parkour. Well, you can do that too. It's called Flow Motion. You can bounce off walls, grind on rails, spin on poles. This comes back in Kingdom Hearts 3, but in a more limited way. Which is, which is a good thing, because to compensate for that range of motion, this game makes overly large rooms with nothing in them. He follows Neku around, but are then ambushed by not Heartless, but Dream Eaters. Are you keeping up? Neku shows that he has a Dream Eater of his own, that fights on his side. And you could have one as well. Actually, two. Did you know? Originally, this game was just gonna have Heartless, as you can see in the first trailer here. Or maybe it was just a placeholder for, for Dream Eaters. Sora continues to follow Neku, but it seems he's been set up. Can't we get a blue coat or something? Neku said he'd bring this guy to Sora in exchange for... something. We don't know yet. Coatman goes to attack Sora, which was not part of the deal, so Neku holds him back. Sora's gonna help, but then he starts feeling that that chocolate from earlier did not just have weed in it. And he's out. Actually, it's the main gimmick of this game. Dropping. This game has two story modes, nothing new on its own, but they play at the same time rather than one at a time. You have a time limit, which you can see next to your health bar, and when it runs out, you switch to the next character. There are items that could extend your time, so you don't drop in the middle of a boss fight, which can happen. 
Anyway, we switch over to Riku, who's wearing what looks like a combination of his first and second game design. He sees another World Ends With You guy, Joshua. He tells him that there are two versions of every world. Sora's in one, Riku's in the other. Joshua tells Riku that if he finds a girl named Rhyme, she might be able to cross him over to Sora's world. While he's telling Riku about Dream Eaters, he's interrupted by Beat over here. But before they can talk, Riku goes night-night. We switch back over to Sora, who's just running around town because he's got nothing better to do. He finds Rhyme, so I guess it would be pretty difficult for Riku to find her. She has amnesia. The only thing she remembers is her name. Sound familiar? Sora thinks she might be tied to Neku, so he gets her to follow him. They find him pretty quick. He says he tricked Sora into seeing Coatman because he said he could bring Neku back to the other Traverse Town, which is where he's from. Unfortunately, Rhyme's not his partner. This makes her so upset that she disappears. Mr. Man comes back and summons... that. After ignoring it, a portal appears and Joshua and Rhyme come through. I guess they figured out that whole portal problem. I know your best friend Riku, too. Really? You know Riku? Well, yeah. I'm kind of omniscient. Joshua pulls out a phantom of what's going on in the other world, where we see Riku with Coatman. He takes off his hood to reveal... <sighs> Let's drop over to Riku to get context. He meets this girl, Shiki. She makes fun of him for being a soy boy, and I'm only half kidding. She runs off, and Riku follows to see Coatman. Or I guess, just man now that we've seen his face. He tells Riku that he'll be imprisoned in this dream world forever. But then Beat jumps in to say, nah uh Man releases another weirdo, and Riku ignores it. Riku sees a phantom of Sora, and I'm tired of this world. Can we move on, please? Oh, thank God. Hunchback of Notre Dame. Wait, what the fuck? Not much to talk about here. Frollo dies in both versions. What's more important in these worlds are the endings. Sora's praying to God for mercy when he's encountered by our old friend. He says a bunch of nothing and God fucking damn it. So he's back? We're just bringing back people now? Who's next? And some- Ah, oh, wonderful! Sudden cut to the real world, and we see a couple of bros waking up at the lab. Classic bro moment. It's Axel's perspective. We see him look at his reflection to see that his little green marks are gone. That means he's Lee again. They're all somebodies now. It seems Briggs in no show though, as well as Isa. Hey, now we're in Tron Legacy, oh my god. They try to do a realistic art style here, a and you know what, it's not so bad. Tron is that thing he is in the movie. The fuck was it called, the Riddler? And now you're up to speed. If we're luck- Our good old pal shows up again, but so does Xemnas, yay. And then they leave. Who's this? I'm Riku. Sam and I were on our- I think she's dead, dude. Back to the garden. Lee and Ienzo are hypothesizing on where Isa and Bragg are. And all I'm thinking about is how when they were nobodies, Axel had Zexion killed. Now we're in Pinocchio world. Sora's dummy, so he greets Jiminy as if they know each other, even though they're in Dream World. Pinocchio says that a man in a black coat told him to play a trick on Sora. I always want to see the scenes of these super bad guys telling Disney characters to do dumb shit. Alright, Pinocchio, I want you to pull a very silly prank on this anime character. You again? Xemnas? This is impossible! You just saw him, Sora. After Xemnas mumbles some nonsense at him, Sora leaves Pleasure Circus? Now they're in Monstro, but it's okay. So is Riku. A black coat has Pinocchio. Riku tells him to let him go, and, and he does. Riku tells the man to reveal himself. Me? Back in Traverse Town, Sora spots a weird bird witch dream eater thingy, and he shoes it away. Joshua tells the lot that the Dream Eater, who I'm going to refer to as Howard, went off to the Riku version of the world. Apparently, it can summon other Dream Eaters. Riku meets up with Beaten Rhyme to duke it out with Howard, but they just start having a friendly conversation right in front of it. Riku even puts away his Keyblade, and it's very clearly pissing Howard off. This is, a, this is actually pretty funny. Howard gets fed up and summons his ghouls, and then, he just, and then he just leaves. But Sora's on the other side to make sure he doesn't escape. He escaped. Back at Yen Sid's tower, they get a letter from Maleficent saying she's taken Minnie captive and she's not afraid to shoot. They go back to the castle. Pete's like, covering her eyes? She could just like crab walk out of there. They insult Pete a little bit and Maleficent says she won't let them insult him like that and she's got grand plans for him which is oddly sweet. She's holding her ransom for this world. Mickey calls her bluff and demands to know what she's really after. <sighs> 
very perceptive. I presume you are familiar with Xehanort. <laughs> she didn't really give an actual reason, she just tries to kill them, but is saved by Lee. Me. Anywho, on to the next world. <clears throat> I said, on to the next world. Oh, oh, wait, this is it. Three Mouseketeers, huh? Interesting choice. You seem confused. After beating up the beagle bitches, he leaves. Eh? Why is the book sans mouse? And now we're in Fantasia. Again, a very interesting choice. He sees Mickey doing his magic shit, but then hey, it's Howard. He's flying towards Sora full speed, and Sora gets in fighting position, fully prepared for the next attack, but still gets whacked hard and knocked out. He didn't even try to dodge it. He wakes up at Yen Sid's tower. Looks like the test is over. Uh-oh, we're still in. Looks like Mickey's doing that. He talks to Sora telepathically, and this one seems to know what a Keyblade is. This seems to be a world from the past, where Mickey was being trained by Yen Sid, a sorcerer's apprentice, if you will. Apparently Howard's got Mickey in this trance, so Sora's got a quest through the world of Fantasia to beat him and free Mickey. Sora's doing his thing when he's encountered by this guy again. I wish just once someone would tell these coat men, yeah, I'm busy right now, could you, could you like fuck off please? He says nothing and leaves. I wish I could leave too. He catches up with Howard and now it's time to settle this once and for all. After murdering my favorite character in this game, Mickey gets control of his body again. In Riku's version, he basically does the same thing, so let's skip to the end of it. Riku gets to a stupid volcano and meets you know who. Could you guess what he tells Riku? Here, I'll give you a second to guess that it's answer E. And then he summons Chernabog. Cool. This version's a lot easier though. After beating him, he frees Mickey and we move on. Meanwhile, back in the real world... Anyway, next world. That never was. What's this place doing here? Hold up a second. Sora's already sealed the seven sleeping keyholes, why isn't he awake yet? This warning is far in advance, but just saying. If you have any family you'd like to say goodbye to, now's the time. Anyway, here's Brag, or, or I guess Zigbar. He's still a nobody? He explains that he was never really taking the test at all. Their gang hijacked the sleepy world and have been guiding him throughout this whole thing without his knowledge. That's ridiculous! It sure is. According to Zigbar, Sora won't be waking up. He'll be stuck there for however long these guys want him there. Ooh, I see you still got that angry look down. He shoots 12 bullets into the ground, summoning the fellas. So is Organization 13 back? Then how come some of the previous members are human again? Did they need replacements? Something about this makes Sora feel funny and he goes out. He awakens on Destiny Islands, where he sees that guy, but without the coat. The one and only Seeker of Darkness goes to him and starts whispering some stuff about who gives a shit. Ansem seems to be the reason that this guy is here in the first place, as getting him here was what reduced him down to the brown robe. Now we're in Traverse Town, seeing little Sora walking around a bunch during the first game. We're reliving our past experiences. I hope it doesn't flash back to that awkward moment at prom. Becky sure was pissed, why did I write that? And just like that, Sora's out again. Rika time. Here we are in the Never Was world. He walks around for a little and eventually finds Sora, in a bubble. He's having a little nap. Let's wake him. Looking into the bubble, he can see Sora's memories too. Uh oh, the bubble's getting kinda dark. He's gonna get swallowed into the void! Oh no, never mind. The darkness manifests itself into, I shit you not, someone called Anti-Black Coat Nightmare. Are you what's trapping him in that nightmare? <laughs> Cause if you are, I'm what nightmares fear! Jesus Christ. After getting rid of that one, I have no idea what that even was, Riku comes to the conclusion that if Sora keeps going after dreams of his past, he'll never wake up. It's a bit of a leap, but one that just so happens to be correct. Ansem comes in and starts taunting Riku, saying Sora's beyond saving. I'm gonna tell you now that I'm about to skip a whole bunch of darkness talk. I still have to talk about it, but you're only getting like 25%. Trust me, it's, it's not worth it. The darkness talk is potentially at its worst here. Okay, okay, I will say that Ansem tells Riku that darkness within darkness awaits him because that's hilarious. Riku gets gobbled up, and now we're Sora again. We're still in the dream, but a Kingdom Hearts 2 dream. Sora turns the corner and sees Namine. Hey, it's been a while. What are you up to these days? He catches her, but then she turns into Shion. I hate it when that happens. She breaks free and he breaks down. 
He wakes up again in a different part of the Never Was. He sees another black coat, and it's our boy Roxas. He explains that he's seeing all these people because they're connected to him. Like, like literally though. Shion and Roxas are quite literally inside of him. All that's left is Ventus, when's he coming? Sora tells Roxas that they're not the same person. Roxas is his own man, so move out of Sora's body and get a job. Roxas takes Sora's hand, and now he's seeing a bunch of Roxas' memories. And it gives Sora a stroke for some reason. I guess it's alright, because Roxas is smiling. It somehow wakes Sora up. Okay, but now he's asleep again, chasing after Kairi and Riku. Oh no, wait, they're actually Aqua and Terra. My bad. Who? Ven. Ven. Hey, huh? there's Ventus. Sora can hear Riku telling him to stop chasing the dreams, but he's doing it anyway. And looks like it led him to Zigbar, who is not Riku or Kairi. Sora finally catches on that... Uh, wait a minute, you guys have been expressing emotion for a while now? You actually have hearts, don't you? Those words were so true that it summons Zemnis. Turns out, they did lose their hearts, but apparently, when a body loses a heart, it starts replacing it. Kinda like a cut. It heals up eventually, right? So why not an entire body part? Okay, you ready? Because here comes the first big one. Zemnis had tricked the members of Organization 13 into believing that they had no hearts, so he can link the hearts that they secretly actually have to Kingdom Hearts, so that he can change the course of the new heart that's developing to be more like what he wants it to be. What does he want it to be, you ask? Drool leaking out of your hole? Oh well, couldn't you already guess? He wants them to be more like him, aka Xehanort. This has been dubbed by the fans as Nording, and that's the most accurate name you can give it. Zigbar knew about this too. He was there from the beginning. If you're wondering why Zigbar has been so dedicated to helping Xehanort throughout this entire thing, well, it's because he really wants that Keyblade. This leads to the iconic line. Me? I'm already half Xehanort. That's nuts! Zeminus further elaborates that the members of Organization 13 were mostly inadequate for their goals. So they have to rebuild, make a new organization. They need better members. Members like Sora. In response to this, Sora lets out a my friends are my power, and it's powerful. Those are just words. You, you've lost. <sighs> Sigbar leaves, and now it's just Sora and Xemnas. They engage in combat, Xemnas tosses some buildings, Sora tosses some balloons, Xemnas dies again, Sora collapses, then her old pal comes in to tell Sora that he basically accomplished nothing, cause he think they can't just bring him back again. Apparently the way they've been tracking Sora is that X on his shirt. Moving on, the man takes Sora back to his secret cave so he can nort him. Riku wakes up in the void with Ansem. He tells Riku that Sora is now impossible to save, but it is possible. All you gotta do is give in to the Abyss. Quick side note, but unless I'm missing something, I don't think Ansem has any reason to be doing this. They wanted Sora as a vessel, not Riku. They specifically did not want Riku for reasons that we'll be getting into in a little bit. Ansem was harassing Riku in Chain of Memories because he needed a body to control, but now he has his own body. He's fine. He doesn't need Riku. So I'm led to believe that Ansem's trying to get Riku to give in to the darkness because they've actually formed some kind of bond, and I think that's cute. Riku says that... Maybe he's right. Maybe... Maybe the darkness... can get him... a girlfriend. He says he will use the darkness to beat Ansem's ass once and for all. Ansem turns this place into a swirly little place, and they duke it out once again. After Riku beats him, Ansem evaporates once more and- Whoa, whoa, what, what the fuck is that? Terra's been working out. This fight's kinda cool. You're in a long ass hallway and you gotta make it towards him, and he keeps pushing you back. I like it. After beating him, Riku and Dark Beast Terra have a little exchange. Remember, Terra gave Riku the ability to use the Keyblade, and now we're never was again. He makes it up the castle, and now we're in the organization room. But no one's there. Except Sora. He's out cold. Before he can make it to him, he's stopped by the boy. He says Riku isn't useful to his people, because he's practically immune to darkness due to mixing it together with the light. So now they've gone for Sora. Xehanort needs 13 vessels for his 13 darknesses to clash against the seven lights. Speak of the devil, they arrive. This new Organization 13, officially dubbed, the, the real Organization 13. This game's a real pain in my ass. All right, second big one. Ready? This guy who's been following us for the entire game is, in fact, Xehanort. No, I don't mean he's someone who got norted, and he's not a heartless or a nobody. He's Xehanort from the past. 
That's right. Time travel. Ansem didn't have his body for a while in the first game because he sacrificed it in order to go back to the past and tell young Xehanort about how cool he is in the future and that he should join. That old bitch is really desperate for vessels, huh? Oh, and the reason they were on Destiny Islands during that flashback was because Xehanort used to live there. It wasn't his birthplace, but he just settled there in his early adulthood. Do you understand why Ansem and Xemnas came back and why they will come back again? Time travel. This young bitch ass fucking Xehanort went back and grabbed everyone who died to come back, so everything we've accomplished in the entire series is basically pointless. You know, I've heard people say that Xehanort is omniscient. He knows everything that's gonna happen, when it's going to happen. But that's not true. The truth is he has about, uh, one, two, three, ab about this many backup plans. He didn't plan on getting his ass whooped hard enough to make him lose memory. That was definitely a snag in the road. But he considered it a possibility. He didn't plan on Terra being so resilient in his body, but he had a way to expel him in case that happened. If he stubs his toe, he has a backup plan on how to work around it. If young Xehanort, Ansem, and Xemnas all just died right here, putting time travel off the table, don't worry, he's probably got interdimensional traversal plans somewhere in his attic. Anyway, young man tells Riku that plain old no-nonsense Xehanort will be stopping by soon, as all the pieces are put together for him to come back. But before they can all gang up on Riku, Mickey comes in with Stopsa to freeze everyone for an extended period of time. But it didn't really work on the youngin over here, because I guess time travel makes you immune to being frozen or whatever. He whips out his weird time keyblade and uses time powers to transport him and Riku to Timeland. Time for the final battle. I'm really punny today. Nah, uh, Riku wins. He's transported back to the organization room, but now Stopsa is wearing off. And hey, look who decided to stop by. Mickey forgot what happened in Birth by Sleep, and asks why he's doing this. So he gives his explanation again, I don't need to go over it. He says that this is the better way to forge the Keyblade, and the last way was stupid, so, so forget about it. He calls Sora a dull, ordinary boy, so now it's personal. Mickey says that there aren't even seven Keyblade wielders to be the lights. Xehanort acknowledges this. Yes, little king. Perceptive. And even that he's taking one away with Sora. But he's so confident that they'll find all the wielders they need. If not, it doesn't matter, he probably has a backup plan for that. But now, it is time to Nort Sora. Which I guess Xehanort can just do with his Keyblade. His high chair gets even higher, and the ceremony has begun. They try to stop it from happening, but they get pinned down by Xehanort 2 and 3. Oh no, he's gonna do it. This is my real hair, okay? The cuck Xavier comes in to save the day. Syax tries to fight him. Looks like he voluntarily got norted. Ansem whips out Shadow Terra to keep them from getting away. But don't worry, Donald and Goofy are here too. They bonk him so hard he disappears. And with that, the Nort gang is out of time. Xehanort tells them that they will meet at the Keyblade Graveyard when the time is right, so about uh, seven years. They get back to the real realm and over to Yen Sid's tower. Sora's still out. Kinda like Ventus back in the day. But according to Yen Sid, he can be awoken. Someone just needs to dive into his heart and pour some cold water on him in there. Look at his face. Sleeping like nothing's wrong. Like there's nothing to even worry about. He's always been like that. The three of us would agree to work on the raft. And then this guy would go take a nap on the beach. You see... He already did this speech. My he doesn't even look worried. Whatever we'd be doing together, he'd find a way to slack off, even trying to leave the islands. I did all the work on the raft by myself. Riku volunteers to go in. Damn, Sora's heart ain't looking too good. But suddenly it transforms into Travers Town. Riku walks around for a little while, but finally he sees the guardian of Sora's heart, the guy who's been with him this whole time. After beating him, Sora reveals himself, but he gets swallowed into his own heart. That sucks, but it's okay. 
That means he's gonna wake up. The place is engulfed in light, and Riku goes back to the land of the conscious. He's afraid he might be hurt, but it was only mentally. You're safe! Riku! <laughs> uh, wait, haven't we got this backwards? And why are you having a tea party? You're safe, Riku! They get up to hear the results of their test. He says that they both deserve the honor, but Sora did go into a coma and almost got norted, so Riku passes and Sora fails. Doesn't seem to bother Sora, though. More importantly, Lee learned a valuable lesson. Must be in the snap of the wrist or something. Oh. Yeah, fuck you too, game. Take a deep breath. You made it to the end. We've now entered the epilogue. Before I put this video out of its misery, I wanted to give you some more video game trivia, specifically the stuff I couldn't find a place for in the video. Did you know? In the original Japanese version of Kingdom Hearts 1, Chernobog's fight theme wasn't Night on Bald Mountain, but instead was one of the game's regular boss themes, Squirming Evil. On top of that, the original Japanese release didn't have difficulty options the Ice Titan, Kurtzisa, or Sephiroth. All those were only in the international version. Did you know? Bahamut from Final Fantasy was originally going to be a summon, but was cut. Woody and Buzz were supposed to be summons in the second game, but were slashed. You're supposed to be able to visit Disney Castle in the first game, but that was destroyed. Other unvisited worlds include a Jungle Book world, and, of all things, a Sword in the Stone world. I hope Kingdom Hearts 4 has a Black Cauldron world. Did you know? During the first cutscene on the sixth day in Kingdom Hearts 2, when Roxas looks out the window, some birds fly by. If you look real close, you can see that for a split second, he turns into Sora, as a little reference to Roxas being a part of him. Did you know? In a recent interview, Nomura stated that there were plans for many more Xehanorts. Among them was an even older Xehanort, and one that looks and behaves like Sora, as a sort of yin-yang between the two. Did you know? Yen Sid was actually going to be the only fourth party member in Kingdom Hearts 2, in the world that never was, wielding his old Keyblade. He was removed because his moveset proved to be too powerful, and would tear through both regular enemies and bosses. Did you know? Those last two facts were really fake, but, but, they, but they sounded real, didn't they? Did you know? In the original PSP version of Birth by Sleep, during the cutscene with Aqua, Mickey, and Kyrie, if you pause at the right time, uh-oh, two Kyries. During the part where you're escorting Queen Minnie to the Cornerstone of Light, if you hacked the game so you could play as Roxas here, strangely enough, he'll have unique voice lines. I'm on it. Ready? Man. This implies he might have been playable for longer than he ended up being. And finally, my last piece of trivia. Did you know? If you look at yourself in the mirror, deep within your own eyes, you'll realize that you still haven't forgiven yourself for what you did two years ago. Anyway, let's finish this. A short amount of time later, Yen Sid summons Riku, Mickey, and Kairi to his office. There they reveal to the young ones about how Aqua saved Riku back in the Realm of Darkness in Kingdom Hearts 1. I guess Riku's both deaf and blind because he couldn't see the light show that was clearly in his view. Riku gets upset about how they kept this from him, but Yen Sid says that if he were told, him and or Sora would stage a plan to get her out of there. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. But now that Riku's a Keyblade Master, he and Mickey can go together to save her. And once she's saved, she can bring them to where she hid Ventus, Castle Oblivion, because they don't know he's there. Probably should have asked before she went to hide him. As for Kairi, she's gonna train to be a proper Keyblade wielder. Yeah, she can use a Keyblade, remember? What, you don't remember the one scene she used it in? Anyway, she's gonna be training with Lee. She protests at first because he kidnapped her canonically at most like a month or two ago. Mickey says, You can trust him! And then she stops talking for the rest of the scene. Once we have Aqua and Ventus and Kyrie and Lee are trained, they'll have all seven Keyblade wielders they need. But what about Sora? Well, he's brought in shortly after and Yen Sid tells him that he's no Keyblade Master, he's weak and useless. You can't even do a simple dream test without getting norted? Pathetic. The only reason we keep you around is because we need as many Keyblade wielders as we can get. Oh, and also because without him, Ventus can't wake up. That's right, Ventus' heart is within him, so we need to bring it back to his own body using a special move called the Power of Waking. Yen Sid has no idea how to teach him that move. He was hoping that he'd learn it during his Mark of Mastery. For now, First and foremost, he needs to get his strength back. That whole incident in Dreamland put him back at level 1. Uh, again. Jesus, can Sora ever catch a break with that? They need him to get his power back quickly, so he's gotta get advice from someone who's been through the same thing. 
And who might that be? Well, just a little someone who was lost, but found his way to the light because of his friends. That's right, Hercules. And with that, they're off. And so am I. It's been a pleasure to work with you guys, but my work is done, and my time is up. If anyone watched this and, most likely, enjoyed it, I intend to make at least one more video like it, as I said earlier. But for now, I bid you farewell. Oswald coming at you with a new video. Now I hear that uh, uh, President Kennedy's making the rounds a little outside my neighborhood and I just want to show, I'm going to show him what happens when you mess with our great America. Let's see how it goes. Jeepers! <laughs> That's what he does to wet a paltrow, right? He zooms in and spreads her out. You know she made candles that smell like her orgasm and her pussy? of all that nonsense. In another recent interview with Nomura, he was asked if Sora was a top or a bottom. In response, he said, Joe, I thought the restraining order was clear. Captain Hook tricks Terra into guarding me treasure by saying there's light in the box and... <laughs> Captain Hook... It's so stupid. So dumb. Riku. Don't bother. You Spaghetti. can no longer reach him where he is. His heart belongs again to dinner. All worlds begin in toasters. And also toast. The heart is no richer. In the end, every heart returns to the lamp oil whence it came. You see, darkness is the heart's true fingers. That's not true. I've learned that deep down there's a light that never goes out.